of your cloud journey. Uh, to start out with on the physical side, on the co-location side, Danielle Lauren will give you an overview of our Montreal footprint and why we are the leading provider of co-location in Montreal. Uh, Neil Alinsky, who is our general manager of cloud and connectivity platforms at Cologix, will uh, explore protecting your hop to the cloud. And um, Nick DiCristofaro uh, will, he is the networking specialist and customer engineer at uh, GCI, Google Cloud Interconnect, Google Cloud. Um, he and uh, John Bacon, the uh, at mod leader for Google's partner engineering team, will go through the GCI product capabilities and Anthos platform. Uh, and then we will tie all those in together uh, with our local systems integrator, CloudOps, uh, providing some insight into hybrid cloud enable, enablement, uh, which will be joined by uh, Danielle Koffler, who is the field CTO for CloudOps, and Fred Jangra, who is the director of sales at CloudOps. Uh, and then we will follow all of that and wrap it up with the Q&A period. So please feel free to ask any questions um, in the chat field. And uh, at the end of the sessions, we will um, ask the panelists the questions that have come through. And uh, you can feel free to ask those questions in either English or French. Uh, and Danielle will be my partner in crime to uh, make sure that we get all those questions answered for, uh, for everybody that's included here. Uh, I'll hand it over to Danielle for the uh, next segment. Thank you, Cameron. So, uh, pour nos participants francophones, uh, la majorité de la présentation va être en anglais, but, mais uh, feel free, soyez bien à l'aise de poser vos questions uh, en français. Et uh, si vous avez d'autres questions, vous pouvez nous uh, contacter à Cologix aussi en français. On sera un plaisir de vous répondre. So, let's uh, dig into that. Uh, so, a, a quick intro for Cologix for those of you that are not as familiar. Ecologix, we're a big interconnect provider uh, across North America. Uh, we in 39 different cities and 11 different markets, and we've got hundreds of net network providers in our various uh, facilities and, and a bunch of public cloud on ramps as well. Uh, we've been in business for over uh, 10 years, uh, and, and we've got uh, an average, our client uh, do have uh, oh, around 13 uh, interconnection with other clients. So we're a very network rich, rich uh, provider with uh, great facility as well. So uh, as an idea, we have, we're, we're getting close to 20,000 cross connect and growing. So that's a little bit of background of Cologix. This is our footprint in North America. As you can see, we're all across uh, the U.S. and the West, the East Coast and the Central region. Uh, and we're uh, in the big three markets in Canada as well. So this is where we do have uh, clouds uh, uh, access market. We see the little asterisk. Neil is going to talk to you a bit about our product, the cloud, the, the CAM, CoLogix access market. So we've got that in most of our uh, facilities as well. And here we go. Let's uh, dig into the, uh, we're going to start a bit more with the, the brick and mortar part, you know, the physical aspect of the security because the cloud still runs in a data center somewhere. So what, what's the physical security, you know, security guards, card access, camera, and then generator UPS to keep everything uh, running. So that's what we, but that's what most people think, you know, when we talk about security, there's a security guard, there's card access, there's camera. But, uh, you know, if you're a bit more familiar, you know that physical security is one thing, but you get the power and cooling security. You need redundant equipment generator in case you using power and UPS to make the smooth transition. So that, that's all part of the of keeping your uh, your environment securely running, but there is more. There is there, there is a lot of uh, of thinking and engineering behind the installation. One of the thing here we, we're, we're talking about is the the safety uh, of the installation. 
some of the word that you might not have heard before is the, the arc flash study. Basically, this on the right is a picture of what we don't want to happen. So we just make sure that we select all the equipment in terms of if there's ever is any kind of a electrical problem or short circuit, the people in the room are protected. So based on the equipment, there's safe distance to be respected and there's protection equipment. Uh, make sure that our people are safe, even in the event of a very unlikely uh, problem with the with electrical equipment, we still want everybody to uh, remain very safe. Uh, another thing we do is what we call the, the breaker coordination. Uh, you guys are pretty, everybody has breaker in their own house, so they know what a breaker is. Uh, but if, you do, if you're not coordinating that, this is something that you might not know of, but on the left, you see, you know, there's a little problem with one of the plug, but it affects everything in red. So we lose the whole building. If you coordinate properly, which means if you select the right breaker uh, and you adjust the breaker that can be adjusted in such a way that what you see on the right is the problem is gonna be contained locally and only the circuit that has a problem is gonna be affected and everything else is gonna be up and running. So this is, again, this is in a very unlikely event of a, some kind of a short circuit and electrical problem. But if you don't plan that ahead, a small little problem can become kind of a disaster and shutting your old site down. So those are a bunch of things we do to keep your environment safe in terms of the, the physical aspect of uh, your installation. Is there more? Of course, there's more. There's also lightning protection. You know, this is also another, uh, detail that uh, it's very unlikely that you can get the uh, lightning near your building, but if you do, that you, you need some system to prevent uh, the lightning from damaging your installation. So there's there's conventional lightning protection, there's active system. So you got to select the right system to protect your environment, make sure that the natural event of a lightning strike is not affecting your, your uh, installation. What you can see here, this is the roof of our Montreal 10 installation. And those little antenna, you see the small little antenna, one, two, three, four, five. This is what is creating the active lightning system. So in case of lightning, those little antenna are gonna attract the lightning. So it doesn't damage uh, uh, any other of our uh, equipment on site. More and more, of course, there's always more. The, the, the other aspect that is might be a bit more familiar is the fire protection. Uh, first of all, you don't want any fire, so you do a lot of prevention and making sure that there's nothing combustible in your room, the room are, are kept clean, and, and you're very careful of preventing the fire. But by law, you need to have a sprinkler most of the time. So you just select the type of sprinkler so they, they, there's no water in a regular state. Uh, so there's no leakage uh, that, that's going to damage any of the equipment. So, uh, But you still need the system to be able to work if there is a real fire. And, and there's a whole bunch of prevention you know, with, uh, with uh, portable fire extinguisher. And all of that needs to be maintain, maintain, maintained and uh, kept in working order. Uh, also, uh, in the data center, we, we want fire detection. And we, we use some system that are called VESDA. It's basically instead of a typical fire detector that you have in your house uh, stuck to the ceiling, it's a bunch of pipe that sample that uh, do, are, are doing sampling of air all the time. So you can, uh, you can detect any kind of smoke uh, very fast and in, in very, basically in all corner of the building. So those type of system are used as well for much more precise and rapid action detection. So if there's ever anything that looks like a fire, we know about it very fast. So we, we can just take care of it before it gets any bigger. Okay, one last one. The other thing uh, also, uh, water is uh, something that uh, is a reality that there's rain and uh, we just wanna make sure we don't have a all of a sudden we don't have a pool over our computer so again there, there's many things that we can do this is an installation that we've done all those yellow uh, pipes are actually big tanks 
So if there's a flash flood or a, a, a big uh, rainstorm, those pipes are going to retain the water, just drain it away from the roof rapidly, but keeping it in the tank so it doesn't overflow the, the, uh, the drainage system from the city. So, so this is another thing that, we, that, that doesn't, it, it's not a flashy thing, but it's uh, very helpful uh, in the long term to make sure the data center space is as secure as possible. And once it's all done, it's under the ground in the parking and it doesn't even uh, appear that it's there. All right. Uh, I'm, I'm going to finish with, uh, with uh, saying that in Montreal, specifically, we have 11 data centers. So those are some of picture of, of our data center. We've got different types of data centers. Some of them are more uh, uh, carrier hotel oriented. Some of them are more uh, big, bigger hyperscale installation. Uh, a few other picture, Montreal 8, and we've got uh, in the east side of Montreal, in Anjou, all the way in Ville Saint Laurent, in downtown, so all across the, the Montreal island and, and region, and we've got a site in uh, in Drummondville as well, about an hour from downtown Montreal. So a lot of different options for all the colocation needs and interconnection needs that you might uh, have in Montreal. And with this, I'll uh, turn this over to uh, our good friend Neil. So are you go, Neil. You might be on mute, Neil. I am on mute. Okay. Hey, everyone can hear me now, right? Um, so that was help setting the stage for how we can protect you in the data center. Um, if, if you come to there, protect your workloads as part of this larger hybrid cloud story, because of course we have both Google on the phone here with us to help with part of this presentation and CloudOps who can help you with your hybrid cloud deployment on uh, your, your multi-site deployments here. So setting the stage for the initial piece of that, which would be that private side in a data center with all the physical protection, of course, the security guards, everything else that's there to protect your workload. Well, then we have another side of this, which is that tether to then start to take you to cloud before later in the presentation today when we talk to you about that cloud piece, some of the software to help you manage it and uh, other items that can help you with your, your journey and your use cases here. So I am here to then talk to you about the next piece, protecting that hop. Um, this is usually the most exposed part of a hybrid cloud deployment um, because you're of course going to have your private side of your workloads hanging out in these diagrams, for example, uh, here that I very crudely put together uh, that has a office building looking blue block on the left hand side. Uh, typically, we do find a lot of customers before they move to data center are going to have their workloads in a number of closets in a mock data center floor they put up on their own. Um, but they're not going to have all of those power and water and electricity uh, and security protections that you would have in a very traditional data center. Um, and on top of that, most customers are going to get to cloud across either the internet directly, uh, you're going to set up a couple public IP addresses on there on one of the services given which of the clouds you use, and you're going to have your uh, workforce get to it through public side using the internet. Or uh, if you have been able to set it up, uh, we do have a lot of corporate clients that do have a VPN, but that VPN is going to be limited. Um, so Google is very generous here with their bandwidth that they're going to allow you to max out with at three gigs per second, but there is still going to be a cap. Um, there is a better way here that we can help you with. Um, we provide it through our data centers um, and through a number of partners that are on the floor as well. So. Uh, Coming on to the next slide, uh, that first point is going to be the dedicated cloud interconnection. So if you want to get to, say, the Google Compute Platform, Google Cloud here, uh, you're going to want to use possibly a dedicated cloud interconnect. That is going to be a cross-connect in a data center. If we're talking Montreal here, which is the focus of today, that is going to be at 1250 René Levesque, uh, the CoLogix Montreal 3 data center in downtown Montreal. Of course, we have a number of other on-ramps throughout our catalog. These are going to be the network node. This is where Google places its network equipment at the edge, the boundary of their backbone network to help you hop from there to their compute regions so that you can get to your compute securely on private Google Fiber um, from a private Google data or, or 
Cologix data center here as we're working together on that. And with this solution, this is just a cross connect here or Cologix, we do have a, a solution in our catalog we call the Metro Connect. So that would be a Metro hop from one of the other 10 data centers that we have in the Montreal footprint to help you get from there to 1250 Rene Levesque so that you can get on net with Google right away. Now, the closer you can get, the lower your risk is, right? Because you have less hops. You can be on the same data center floor as the Google networking equipment. So it is one hop from you to them on a private fiber cable that gets directly over so that you have the lowest amount of risk, the lowest latency here to get directly on that network, to get to cloud. So you are not dealing with the public internet fluctuations. You're also not dealing with some of those public bandwidth limitations and the high cost of that. You're gonna deal with paying ingress and egress to your cloud, managing that bandwidth with an ISP or another partner. Now this way you get it private on private infrastructure and very often your cost is gonna be lower for that, which is also going to reduce your other risk, your risk of outages and other issues. So this is a great solution for customers. Typically, it's going to be sold in a one gig, 10 gig, or in some facilities, a 100 gig variety. So it is going to be at the port speed there because it's going to be your port directly over to Google's port with a cable in between. We do offer this at Cologix here within our data center. Now, if that's a little bit too much for you, or you're looking for other efficiencies, then we have one of our big products that was already teased to you here. We call it uh, our, our network exchange, the Cologix Access Marketplace. So that's gonna be this fun little circle here of a switch fabric that is active, it is online. We are hosting these NNIs, these network to network interfaces directly with Google. We keep them online at all times with plenty of capacity with Google. So we always stay ahead of that, make sure we have capacity available to sell on demand. So if you don't wanna set up a dedicated fiber, you don't wanna deal with that Metro Connect solution, worry about that hop across the city, any of that. If you are in any Cologix data center, no matter where that is, you would be able to order a virtual circuit across our switch infrastructure to get to that Google on-ramp. So this is going to still stay private. It is going to be now though flexible and on demand because you are spinning up a virtual circuit, not doing a physical cable. We manage the cabling and all that and keep it online. So in this way, we can spin up VLANs. We're going to hand off to you uh, for that layer two circuit, get you over to Google at any speed from 50 meg at the low end um, up to a 10 gigabit circuit today and our 100 gig infrastructure is being deployed and that will be available starting next year in a number of our data centers including Montreal. Um, so there's your teaser in this call. Um, this is going to allow you to get that same service to get to the edge of Google on that private network to protect your traffic so it is not subject to internet fluctuations, to internet eyes, to anything going over public infrastructure there that could possibly happen to it. No, this is going to stay on private fiber in Cologix straight to the Google on-ramp across our floor. So you're staying in a protected private environment to get there so that you can then ride that on great dedicated bandwidth to your cloud services. And you can get the efficiencies of using a single port to provision multiple Ethernet virtual circuits, EVCs, to, say, Google. So you could have five different circuits to five different environments here. So you can manage your dev test, your DR, your production. No matter what it is, they could all have their own dedicated bandwidth. So this is the solution going forward. We see you're often going to hear it called a network exchange. Um, this is our version of it that provides that access to our top cloud providers like Google, as well as um, other parts of our ecosystem, other providers who've signed up. Or if you as a provider would like to host your services on here, we do that, allow that as well. So you can use this private infrastructure on demand to help customers get to you and advertise on this marketplace to use this as a form of virtual cross connection or virtual metro connection for your own service with the same reliable items that will help customers privately and securely get to cloud services. What does it look like? Well, you're going to need a physical interconnect in some form. This is usually called a port on our platform and on others from partners that we have that sell similar services in our data center. So that port does include a cross connect and that dedicated port on the infrastructure. That's your layer one. You're going to get that as single or redundant on one or 10 gig, normal port speeds here, fiber or copper. And then you're going to provision circuits on that um, single or uh, you're redundant, and that's going to take you out of market if you need to. So if you are across Canada, you are currently hanging out in Vancouver um, or Toronto, and you want to get connected to Google in Montreal, hand it off right on that doorstep of that Google on-ramp in Montreal. We will help with that transport. Or if you'd like to use one of our many carriers in the data center, we'd love to refer you to them as well and help you out with that. And again, speed's going from 50 meg to 10 gig. 
All right, where is this available? Uh, currently in our footprint, we have Vancouver, which just came online. Uh, we have Toronto that we're connected to as well on two different zones. And then we have Montreal, of course, which is the focus of today. Um, so we do have redundancy with Google in Montreal that we can get you connected to from our footprint. Uh, now, when we put that side by side, on the left hand here, you're going to see the Google Compute regions. This is where the servers are located for those cloud services. So please keep in mind the network node here for that Google interconnect on ramp is going to be oftentimes in a different site from where the servers and the compute are, but that is the edge of the Google network. That is where you're going to connect to get on their backbone to privately get in the data center. Uh, there is not an option to go to the data center today. Those are private sites. They are hidden. They are secure. Um, you're going to want to go to a good shared co-location facility like, hey, say Cologix, uh, to help connect on that data center floor in a carrier hotel to get on net um, to be able to manage your private infrastructure there in a secure facility um, where, with your items that you want to keep full control of. So you have some storage or some private backline infra, or this is your hop from your internal desktop environment for your developers and admins and others to get into your Google Cloud services from the back end. And as you can see on this map on the left-hand side, those compute regions, you're going to have compute resources available in Montreal and Toronto. If you do want to stay sovereign and in Canadian borders here, but if you are jumping on the Google backbone there from that on-ramp in Montreal, you can get to any of the other compute regions that are available across North America uh, for the same rates. You can look up that pricing on Google's website. Um, but if you want to jump over into the US, you'd be able to ride from Montreal down to their North Virginia region or to their Iowa region or others from there as well. So all those blue dots on the left-hand side um, are going to be Google compute that is online today. That white dot in the middle is a coming soon. Um, and then the left-hand side here is showing you where those on-ramp locations are in major metro markets across Ecologic's footprint. So how we can help you get connected to get to that compute. And how easy is it? Oh man, if you... <laughs> Four steps. Four steps is going to be it to help you get online with Google. Uh, you're going to log into GCP. You are going to create a VLAN attachment in the networking section there. That's going to give you a key called the pairing key. Come back to Cologics with that pairing key. You submit that in our portal. Uh, that is going to tell us everything we need to know about that connection, where it is, the bandwidth, the details, the um, um, VLAN, everything that's been reserved for it. We're going to use that to complete that circuit. Uh, from end to end with Google. You're then going to log back into their portal to activate. This is a security step. This makes sure that you are getting there to say, yes, I, with the network admin rights in this portal, am authorizing this connection because we are bridging two networks, right? We want to put some extra steps in there to protect your hop between you and there and make sure, yes, you fully authorized it. You requested that key. You had rights to do this. This is exactly what you'd expect for that service. Once you do that, layer two comes up. Everything will be online. You will have your physical connection, your link, and then your MAC addresses. You'll start to see that flow on both sides. You'll be able to ping from side to side if you want, just to test that connection. But really from there, you're going to want to bring up BGP uh, to get your routes advertised from both sides to complete that connection so that you have full transport from end to end. And uh, that is it. That's how easy it is. All of your locations, all the protection we can offer for an on-demand service. Or again, if you wanted that dedicated service, uh, if you want to cross-connect at 1250 Rene Levesque. Otherwise, it's here to jump on to the next step. And that is a Kahoot. Hi, all. If you want a chance to win a Amazon gift card, you can join us in Kahoot. Um, you can do it a few different ways from Zoom's Kahoot app at your, your menu items, or if you just go to kahoot.it and enter in this game pin above, we have three quick questions. And I apologize, I was in the, the other game. Getting ahead of myself here. So we'll see if Jesse and Captain Canada can have a, another competitor and I'll, I'll hit start here. Three quick questions. All right, we have three competitors here.
What color jersey is worn by the leader of the general classification in the Tour de France? All right, Captain Canada is at the top of the board. Question two, three. Who directed the Lord of the Rings? Looks like everyone knows their stuff here. Jesse's at the lead, fastest click of the West. In which film did Humphrey Bogart say, we'll always have Paris? There you go. See who the fastest click was. RJ's number three, not too bad. Jesse's number two and Captain Canada is number one. All right, back to our presentation. And I am passing this over to Nick Dick Cristofaro at Google. Okay. All right, uh, thank you. And uh, so good good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you're calling in from, uh, if you're not calling from the East Coast. Uh, so my name is Nick DeCristofaro. I'm a network specialist customer engineer uh, with Google Cloud. And really that what that means is I spend most of my time helping customers with network products and services, specifically all of our Google Cloud uh, network products and services, helping them build and architect network solutions uh, within GCP. I specifically focus on our hybrid and multi-cloud connectivity products. So I sp spend a lot of my time discussing Cloud Interconnect as one of them. And today I'd like to talk to you about the Cloud Interconnect product and how to extend your on-prem network through a secure, highly available, low latency connection. So let's talk about the architecture, and this is really building on to what Neil discussed in terms of the, the Cloud Access Marketplace and the dedicated interconnect uh, solution. So really, let's put all these components together and see how they all fit in. So on the right, you have here your CoLogic connection. So this is you know, the CoLogic on-ramps. In, in, in this example, we're talking about CoLogic Montreal and TL3. So this is where you would potentially have your workloads either locally within a CoLogic facility, so within a, a cage and a rack in a cage, or through a cross-connect through uh, a third-party provider, uh, where that would ultimately connect back to your uh, on-prem uh, uh, on location. And this is where, for example, Anthos, which we'll I'll talk about later on, would potentially be connected, right? So it either would be sitting directly in Cologix or somewhere extended along the line through a cross-connect with a provider. Now, as we move in the middle here, you can see from the right-hand side going into the middle, you have your, your on-prem router. So, so this is routing equipment that you would configure. And this is physically cross-connected to a node, which we call the Google Peering Edge node, that is within the Cologic facility. So Neil mentioned that we have this uh, this on-ramp location within a Cologic facility at MTL3, and this is where the physical cross-connect actually takes place. So you can see here that you have two connections, and these two connections are actually very important. And they're important, why? Because they are in redundant zones. So you can see here, I have zone one and zone two within the Cologic facility. And these zones are specifically what we reference to as edge availability domains, or EADs, and these are very important from an SLA perspective. These two zones are redundant zones, which are meant to take care of uh, independent physical domain failures, as well as uh, maintenance activities specifically. So for example, a zone one that is uh, that you can see here depicted on in a diagram, and a zone two that you have in the same facility, these zones are protected from maintenance activities, and they are done in scheduled maintenance uh, uh, scheduling, meaning that if you do any kind of activity on zone one, or if we need to take any kind of equipment uh, offline, only zone one will be affected and zone two will not be affected. Now, what is very important with that is that this only takes place within a coordinated metro scheduling event, meaning that zone one and zone two in this design is only relevant for the metro of Montreal. 
meaning that if we do schedule maintenance in zone one, we are guaranteeing that zone two in Montreal will not be affected during that maintenance activity. It does not mean that necessarily another zone in a different metro, if you have connections in, in uh, Toronto, for example, it may be that zone one in Toronto would be scheduled at the same time as zone one in Montreal. So this is a very important key point when I speak to customers, when they're building topologies, is to understand that they need to build a redundant topology within the same metro. So zone one and zone two connections are critical within the same metro. So this is why this is depicted this way. And this will build a different type of SLA for you. So for example, if you're building a connection from Montreal to the Montreal region, and you're building it this way, with our new, uh, we have a new data plane that uh, we are launching across various metros. If you are on, on our new data plane, you will be receiving a 4.9 of SLA with this type of connection. If you're on the old data plane, you would get a 3.9 SLA. Uh, however, depending on the topology that you're building, you may get a 4.9 SLA if you duplicate this connection into a different metro and a different region as well. But I'm happy to discuss this uh, in a lot more detail if you have any architectural uh, questions um, as well offline. Now, as we move to the left-hand side, you have here your VPCs, and this is actually a construct within Google Cloud Platform where your projects are deployed. Within your projects, you have a VPC, and in there, you eventually deploy compute infrastructure. So this could be your Anthos workloads within GCP. This could be other types of compute infrastructure or even API services that you're reaching privately through this connection. Now, you can see that I have a cloud router, and this cloud router is actually a virtual BGP speaker that sits within GCP. And you can see end to end, this cloud router is actually establishing a connection from the cloud router here all the way to your on-prem router sitting within Cologix or ultimately on-prem. So that is a dedicated connection that you have between the two. And this is where we establish a BGP session where you would exchange routing prefixes from your VPC in cloud and your on-prem workload sitting in your, in your on-prem network, right? And as you can see here, again, building onto the two zones that exist in the middle, I have two different VLAN attachments, as Neil mentioned, these virtual circuits that are built between the cloud router and your on-prem router sitting uh, on-prem, and you have these redundant connections that are built across these two zones. So this is either built when you're building a dedicated interconnect, this is a dedicated connection that you have, you're building these two across these two ports that you would ultimately be building yourself, or if you're using the uh, Cologix Access Marketplace, right? You're going to be building that up through their their access, their marketplace. And when you're building the VLAN attachments and those pairing keys, you're actually going to select a redundant uh, uh, pairing key, which builds it in zone one and zone two effectively. Now, one thing to note here is that we have also the ability to build a encrypted uh, connection between your on-prem workload and your VPC workloads here. And uh, this is called IPsec over interconnect. And I'd be happy to discuss this as well in more detail if you're interested in establishing that secure encrypted link between your, your on-prem workloads and the cloud. So not only do you have that dedicated connection between your on-prem workloads, direct fiber to our Google peering edge, eventually connecting to cloud, you can also, you can also um, ensure end-to-end -end encryption between your workloads in Cologix and then ultimately to GCP. Uh, and one thing that I wanna also point out here in the middle here, we have that Google peering edge that's connected directly to your router. In case of the cloud access marketplace that Neil was mentioning uh, through Cologix, then Cologix effectively has that NNI connection in the middle there, right? And that NNI connection is really building on uh, to that, that cross connection between Google and Cologix. So you're effectively connecting to Cologic through that NNI port, ultimately to Google's peering edge. Now, moving on to discuss uh, a bit about the interconnect costs and how this works. So both uh, speaking of on dedicated and partner interconnects, so on the dedicated side, right, again, you as an end customer owns this, the GCP port. You're effectively leasing that port on our Google peering edge, and you're building attachments directly through the, co the cloud console and you're effectively being billed directly for the port that you're leasing, as well as the individual VLAN attachments that you're building as well. From the partner interconnect model, again, this is the based on the Cologic uh, access marketplace as an example that Neil was mentioning, you're 
effectively just building those VLAN attachments. So CoLogic owns that GCP port, and you would build those VLAN attachments via the service provider portal, via their, 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 their marketplace portal, as well as in GCP. So you're, as Neil mentioned in the step-by-step -step provisioning, you build that in the GCP console, and then you go into their portal to activate the connection. Now the VLAN attachments, again, these are the virtual circuits that you're actually building the traffic across. That's where routes are exchanged. That's where you're actually establishing data between your on-prem network and GCP. They can be provisioned on and charged on an hourly basis. And each bandwidth carries a, a different per hour fee. So in case of the partner interconnect model, you have all the way from 50 megabit, all the way even to 50 gigabits, depending on if there's a hundred gig uh, connectivity circuit that is that's available at the other end. On a dedicated interconnect side, we do 10 to 50 gigabits VLAN attachments. Again, depending if you're using uh, you know, high capacity, um, more, more than a 10 gig port, then you can support higher attachment capacity as well. And these are billed at different rates. Uh, our billing, our, our, our list prices are listed on our website if you're interested to see those list prices uh, as well. And the other thing to note is from an interconnect cost specifically, we also offer discounted egress rates uh, as well. So depending where you are around the world in North America, the list price two cents per gigabyte uh, that you would get when you're egressing from cloud as well to your on-prem workload. So there's another additional benefit from a cost structure perspective to use a, a interconnect circuit. Now, just speaking a bit about some of the technical aspects of this as well, when you're building this up. So both for dedicated and partner interconnect VLAN attachments, you have that VGP peer that I mentioned. So that is an eVGP session that you're building between your on-prem router and the GCP cloud router. And these are routes that are established and dynamically advertised between these two environments. The eBGP session, the neighbor configuration must have multi-hop configured as well. So this is a, a configuration setting that you have to enable on your on-prem router. And as well from a dedicated interconnect perspective, there are some specific physical layer connectivity requirements. For example, long range optics, 1310 nanometer, all of these uh, uh, extra uh, configuration or, or parameters are listed as well on our website. So I did not list them all here, but there are specifics in terms of when you're establishing a cross connect on what kind of fiber and transceivers uh, you have to be using. And finally, the VLAN attachment, uh, building on to what Neil mentioned, this is one of the biggest, uh, um, biggest advantages that you have when you're building a connection from a Metro edge. For example, if you are building a connection from CoLogic Montreal 3, you have the ability to directly build that, that VLAN attachment into any of our other cloud regions in North America, so in the same continent. So for example, if you do not have workloads in North America, Northeast one, but you have workloads that are sitting in the United States somewhere on the East Coast, potentially on the West Coast or Central, you have the ability to directly build that VLAN attachment at no additional cost to those cloud regions. So effectively, you can build a backbone connection from that edge location in CoLogix all the way through using Google's backbone to these locations, uh, these cloud compute locations in North America, as well as you can build redundant topologies as well, DR sites if you wish, to also have multiple regions. And then from there, you can route traffic across our global backbone to these other regions as well. So you could potentially even have workloads in Europe or in, a or in APAC and actually route through Google's backbone, not directly establishing con a connection, but routing through an initial connection in North America and then using our backbone to reach other uh, cloud workloads as needed. And with that, uh, you know, if you have any other additional questions, please feel free to reach out specifically on, you know, architecting your cloud journey or securing your, your, your connection to cloud. Feel free to reach out to me. Be happy to answer any questions. And for now, I'll hand it off to my colleague, John, to talk about Anthos. Awesome. Thanks, Dick. Uh, so good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is John. I'm the partner engineering uh, lead for AppMod. Uh, so what that means is I work with our customers and our services partners at Google Cloud when it comes to anything AppMod related, which is hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, uh, Kubernetes, CI, CD, and, and other things like that. So today I'm going to give a brief overview of Google's solution to hybrid and multi-cloud, which we call Anthos. A couple of things to note before I get started is Anthos isn't a single product. Um, it's a suite of products. I'm not gonna go into every component, um, but I'm gonna highlight some of the core components of Anthos that I like to talk about when I'm speaking to my customers. Second, uh, I'm gonna try to keep this high level. I might dive deep every once in a while, 
However, the key takeaways should be the business value you get from Anthos. So if anyone at your company wants a deeper understanding of the product, I'm happy to have a follow-up conversation or connect you with uh, your Google Cloud account team. So um, most organizations have either taken the leap to public cloud or at least have some sort of cloud strategy that they're exploring. But a lot of workloads are still gonna remain on-prem and they're gonna con continue to do so for a while. And this is for various reasons. Uh, proximity to end users could be one, compliance or data locality rules and so on. So while organizations are building out a cloud strategy, a big component of that is understanding how do they handle hybrid cloud or how do they handle multi-cloud? However, some challenges start to arise as you adopt these technologies and, or adopt these strategies. Security versus agility, right? Developers wanna push code to production quickly. Doesn't matter where that infrastructure is, but the security teams wanna ensure that that code is safe and the tools used by developers are verified and trusted by them. And this sometimes slows down the development process. Reliability versus cost. You know, when people think of reliability, they think of adding redundant machines, uh, data protection tools, and other services that ends up increasing your cost. And lastly, portability versus consistent, consistency. This is a big one for hybrid and multi-cloud. When I start to run modern applications across different environments, like on-prem or in another cloud, I want my application to be portable, but I also want a consistent experience. My infrastructure team, they want to deploy to on-prem or to GCP or to another cloud without having to make a significant change or adopt new toolings. So how does Anthos help with any of this? So first I'm going to re reiterate that it's not a single product, but actually a suite of products that when together help solve the challenges I just mentioned. I'm going to briefly discuss some of these components over the next few slides. Uh, but before that, here's just a high-level list of some of the benefits that it does provide. Write once, deploy anywhere. This means a developer doesn't have to build an application differently, depending on the environment that it's going to be deployed into. Consistency across environments. So whether I'm a security engineer, an infrastructure admin, or a developer, Anthos is going to provide a consistent set of tooling that I can leverage no matter what environment I'm going to deploy into. And as I speak of some of the components, you'll see how the rest of these benefits are achieved. Now, before I go into the components, I like to set the stage for who this applies to within your organization. The different components of Anthos provide various benefits depending on your role. So as I talk about the components, you might hear me mention, um, this is why a security engineer would want this component, or this is the value to the infrastructure team or the app owner. Um, each of these individuals in your organization will see good, great value out of one or more of the components that I'm about to talk about. And lastly, before I go into the components, um, I think it's important to note that a lot of the components uh, in Anthos are built on top of open source products. And this helps avoid any sort of vendor lock-in. And it goes back to that portability um, that I mentioned, allowing the apps to be portable and, and not stuck to, to one vendor or another. OK, so let's actually talk about what is Anthos and, and where can I deploy it. Like I mentioned before, it's a suite of components. It's going to help with things like policy management, cluster management, um, and so on. It can be, can be deployed on-prem, at the edge, or across multiple different clouds. So when I drill down, you can see some of the components which I'm going to discuss are Anthos GKE, Anthos Service Mesh, and a few more that you see on this chart. Um, we also have deployment options at the bottom for on-prem that includes VMware or bare metal. And we also support running in AWS or Azure. And at the very right, you see attached clusters. What that means is I can actually connect a non-Google Kubernetes cluster into Anthos to provide a single pane of glass visibility into all my clusters. Um, that's important because if you adopt Anthos and you start using Anthos GKE in a lot of different environments, but you're still running, let's say, EKS and AWS or OpenShift on-prem, and you're not ready to migrate over to Anthos GKE just yet, you can still have some management capabilities of that cluster from within the Google Cloud Console or the CLI. All right, so one of the core components of Anthos is Anthos GKE. And it's important to understand really what is GKE and a little of the history about, uh, behind it. So admittedly, you know, Google was a little late to the cloud game. 
Um, but when it comes to Kubernetes, we have the most experience and the most mature offering out there. And this is really important because it's not a secret that Kubernetes is the de facto standard for container management, but it's also no secret that setting up Kubernetes is pretty difficult and cumbersome. Not only that, but it, come, it becomes even more confusing when I look at things like day two operations, right? My upgrades, monitoring and logging, security operations, and so on. In fact, customers that try to deploy Kubernetes on their own oftentimes fail because you don't really have a good plan on how to handle day two operations. And so that's why having a managed version similar to GKE is extremely important. So GKE assists our customers with cluster creation, making it very easy. It provides a lot of advanced cluster management features like load balancing, auto scaling, auto upgrades and repairs, as well as logging and monitoring. All of this with very little effort from developers or infrastructure teams. All you have to do is throw your code in a container and then you can create a cluster using the command line, the Google Cloud Console, or interfacing directly with the API. It's really easy to do and it doesn't really require someone with an intimate knowledge of Kubernetes to do this. As I mentioned, Anthos has multiple products and at the core, we have Anthos GKE. So it's taking this mature enterprise ready distribution of Kubernetes that we provide currently to our GCP customers and allowing you to deploy it into your own data center or even into other clouds that are not GCP. And this is what you see in our console. It shows all of the clusters you have deployed, including um, you see GKE running at GCP. You see some clusters running on-prem that just say GCP. Um, you see some that say, uh, um, you know, just GCP, which means we're just through open source Kubernetes on top of some VMs. So that's a non-GKE cluster running. So that's what it would look like if you had, let's say, EKS or OpenShift or AKS attached as well. So the second component I'm going to talk about is Anthos config management. So imagine that you have one team that deploys a Kubernetes cluster. That team has to worry about things like, how do I enforce policies for that cluster? How do I put in security guardrails? Which may or may not be that difficult if all I have is one cluster. But imagine that that team starts you know, telling everybody else within the IT organization at your company how amazing Kubernetes is. So someone else starts to use it, and then another team, and another team. And now you have these clusters running across your entire company. Some may be on-prem, some in Google Cloud, some may be in another cloud. Or even if it's the same type of environment, imagine that you're a fast food restaurant or a, you know, a bank that has branches all over the country, and you wanna run Kubernetes in each store to handle things like point of sale, inventory, or whatever else. This is actually really common today. Uh, it's, it's gaining a lot of traction. In these scenarios, how do I ensure that the policies I set are going to be enforced across you know, hundreds or thousands of clusters? Um, how do I ensure that an IT admin doesn't make a change to a cluster on accident or maliciously that's running in one of these you know, edge locations or in my data center? And the answer to that is config management. Config management allows you to define and enforce policies across all of your Kubernetes deployments. You take a central, a central Git repository and it can manage things like access control policies like RBAC, resource quotas, namespaces, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud. And config management's declarative, so it's continually checking for your cluster state and it's applying your desired change or desired state to enforce those policies. Um, it's also going to put security guardrails in place. So as an admin, I need to create a consistent environment that offers security by default for my developers. So you can deploy to new environments very quickly, and then you have a confidence that that desired cluster configuration has been applied. Um, it helps maintain uh, control over cluster sprawl, as I mentioned earlier. So as more and more teams start to start to adopt Kubernetes or to grow your environments for redundancy or to expand to new geos or for whatever reason, you start to increase your overhead in managing separate configurations. And config management solves that problem by delivering a single centralized place for multi-cluster management. And the last component I'm going to talk about is Anthos Service Mesh. If you're not familiar with the Service Mesh, don't worry. Um, all you need to know is that a service mesh automates a lot of functionality into your network. A lot of the benefits that you get are things that a developer would typically have to code into their application. But with Anthos Service Mesh, the developer doesn't have to worry about any of that. It's automatically handled for you. 
The main th three things I like to highlight when talking about a service mesh is observability, agility, and policy-driven security. So when I talk about observability, ASM monitors things like error rates and latency and saturation and traffic out of the box, which allows you to create SLOs based on those metrics. It also builds a nice topology graph for you in the console that shows how your services are communicating, which service can talk to which and, and which services can't talk to each other. The second thing I like uh, to talk about is agility. So when deploying an application, developers often need to account for things like figuring out what happens if a service fails, right? Is that gonna impact my other services downstream, right? We call that circuit breaking. Or how do I handle routing traffic between different applications? What if my application is running on-prem and I wanna send traffic to the cloud as part of a canary rollout? Anthos Service Mesh does all of this for you without a developer having to modify their code or make any changes. And lastly, policy-driven security. Anthos Service Mesh handles certificate management as well as authorization and authentication between my services. It's also gonna add MTLS to encrypt the traffic as my services are talking to each other. Okay, so each one of these components, you know, we could dive deep into for a few hours each. And this isn't even everything included with Anthos. We have migration tools to help you get to, to containers. We have additional security features that help with the, making sure that you have a secure software supply chain and, and many, many more. Um, but what I wanted to do is just highlight some of the core components that a lot of our customers are coming to us for. Um, and the takeaway really is, you know, when you start to build out a hybrid cloud or a multi-cloud environment, you're faced with lots of different software licenses and inconsistent experience, you know, added work for your infrastructure teams and your application owners as they have to make adjustments for all these different environments. With Anthos, all of this is handled for you. So some of you might be thinking, well, what about legacy applications, right? How do I manage virtual machines or Windows workloads if that's what I'm currently doing? Um, what if you're not ready to modernize all your applications? So Anthos does have support for virtual machines coming very soon. Right now it's all containers and Kubernetes, um, but in a few months we'll be able to manage virtual machines. And you can already run Windows uh, containers in GKE on GCP with support for the other environments to follow. Now, with that, I'm actually going to pass it back off. I believe we have one more Kahoot to do uh, before we hand it off to CloudOps. Hi, all. If you'd like to join our second quick game, um, you have a chance to win an Amazon gift card here. So I will open up my screen and I actually have the right code up this time. So I'll, I'll give it a moment for folks to join. You can do it on your phone, on your web browser, or if you even have a Zoom app for Kahoot, it pops right out on your screen. And while we'll she see if there's any competitors for Jesse here. Yeah, while she waits for people to join, I'm again encouraging people to ask questions in the chat field and we'll answer those at the end of the sessions. Okay, I'm gonna hit start. Four competitors. What is the alternative name for a mountain ash tree? I think I gave too much time here. It's a rowan tree. What is the third sign of the zodiac? Gemini. This one's for double points. You can do this to your dog or to your enthusiasm. And just in case anyone watches this show, it returns next month. That's right, curb. Number three, we have Tammy O. Number two is Jesse. Dun, 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 dun. Who is number one? Captain Colo. It sounds like a Cologix team member. So um, we'll, we'll look into uh, see if Tammy and Jesse are eligible. Thanks, guys.
And with that, I will pass it over to the Cloud Ops team. And I will get to their presentation. Thank you. Um, before, you know, until I get the uh, control of the, the presentation, uh, we'll, as mentioned earlier, we'll have this in English. Uh, but uh, je vous encourage aussi à vos questions en français ou en franglais aussi. Uh, Dan et moi, on peut, uh, on peut soutenir les questions aussi. Donc, uh, I'm going to try to get control of that. And I think I have it now. So hey everyone, quick uh, quick agenda on this one. Gonna briefly talk about uh, cloud ops and services we offer and how and where we can help. And uh, Dan is gonna go through some of the some use cases with Antos, namely. So that would be very interesting. Thank you guys before for the very interesting uh, presentation. Um, CloudOps has been in the cloud business for uh, since 2007, and that's been quite a while. And uh, we've sort of arranged uh, around these three pillars, uh, what I call the three pillars. The first one, which would be around enablement. Second one around uh, professional services and consulting. And the third one around services and support. Uh, and on the enablement part where uh, this is, you know, the journey often goes from left to right uh, on your screen, uh, and we often start with uh, assessment of your platform and your DevOps practices as well, where we can uh, understand what's your current uh, state of your platform and identify your the gaps uh, to help you go to where uh, your current, your desired state of your platform and business requirements. Uh, enablement part also means uh, raising the competencies of your team. If you have gaps in uh, adopting uh, cloud native technologies, we have workshops, which we offer very uh, hands-on practical workshop uh, that can help uh, raise uh, your team expertise into cloud native technologies. So as we uh, start from uh, the enablement side uh, on our journey to the cloud and adoption of cloud native technologies, we can then move on to uh, professional services where we have uh, consulting services and uh, professional services to uh, adopt uh, the cloud platform, set, help set up, do architecture. Uh, we do also do lift and shift uh, and work with uh, definitely adopting Anthos in your uh, environment and adopting your uh, cloud environment as well. And moving on then to the third pillar where this is where we get into the day two operations where we help uh, support uh, your environment and your platform, where we have managed services, where we own it 24 seven, have responsibility, take the risk uh, of supporting your application but with the, uh, the nice services that we've seen today, the risk is much lower. Nevertheless, there's lots of uh, tasks to be done regularly and we can help uh, your organization support that. We can also supplement with our augmented support offering, supplement your uh, operation team uh, with the right help at the right time. Now, where we help, this is what I call the uh, sandwich slide where we have a very simplistic view of an application stack. Uh, the top part, the application uh, and development, this is where uh, the, you, the customer, this is where you have your, uh, you bring the most value, where you can have your team focus on developing your code, evolving it, making updates, getting new features in, uh, getting to market faster. And we help definitely on the, lower part where we uh, have the infrastructure. This would be the cloud and your on-prem uh, your on-prem setup uh, with, with Antos, for example, and also uh, in the middle where we call it the, the platform, the DevOps platform and the tool chain where it's all the different tools and um, uh, components that uh, support your application. 
We've helped a number of organizations. Uh, we don't have any specific market where we deal with telcos, finance uh, market, large and small organization. So this is just a quick glimpse there. Uh, and uh, I encourage you to send us questions. If you have any questions, uh, Dan and myself are available for questions in Francais as well. And I'm gonna pass it on to Dan. I'm gonna talk a bit about our assessment and some use cases. Thanks, Fred. Uh, so as a field CTO for CloudOps, um, I often um, am spending a, a lot of time with our, our clients, uh, whether new or existing clients. And uh, we spend a lot of time uh, in, in a number uh, of different areas, often uh, engagement, uh, particularly with uh, new clients, will start with uh, an assessment of some sort to gauge uh, the level of maturity and understand uh, the uh, business value that the organization is trying to achieve and try to identify uh, any gaps and, and build a roadmap to get from uh, where you are to uh, where you wanna be. And these assessments uh, can encompass um, all kinds of different areas. Uh, we can see uh, sort of the, um, uh, the, some of the areas uh, on, on the slide here. Um, on the strategic side, you know, we always like to start with uh, the business strategy and, and the business value you're looking uh, to get out of uh, an engagement or, or where you want to take your business to. And then we can help with uh, development, deployment, uh, management, and overall governance strategy uh, as well. And we'll go into the details. Uh, we do a, a lot of uh, DevOps platform and practice assessments uh, where we can come in and help you uh, adopt DevOps practices if uh, that's new to you or help you optimize uh, your existing uh, DevOps practice uh, if there are uh, particular uh, pain points there. And we help really with the full uh, application lifecycle management, where um, from build all the way through to uh, operating, uh, we can uh, help optimize your uh, existing uh, practices and, and tooling, um, as well as uh, take on some of the uh, management or day two uh, operations for those um, uh, for those practices, uh, depending on on what your requirements are. Um, I, I don't seem to have uh, control. Oh, there we go. All right. So uh, in, in addition to assessments, uh, we also do a, a lot of workshops, um, skilling up your teams uh, are really a, a key a piece of um, the, the entire digital transformation um, process, as well as being able to optimize uh, what you're doing, uh, adopting new technologies. Uh, oftentimes, our, our customers are lacking certain skill sets or, or really want to take uh, the existing skills within their organization to the next level. And so you can see on the screen here some of the different types of workshops we offer. Uh, we were actually uh, the first certified um, uh, Kubernetes uh, training organization, I, I believe, uh, globally. Um, so we have a, a lot of experience in the microservices world working uh, with uh, Kubernetes-based uh, platforms uh, from uh, a number of different vendors, and including Anthos, which um, uh, we really like. Uh, it, it's a great platform, and the hybrid cloud capabilities um, really shine through, as uh, John was showing uh, previously. Uh, we also uh, offer workshops around secrets management, which is, um, you know, a key but often overlooked component of uh, the modern DevOps uh, pipeline. 
Uh, we help with uh, infrastructure as code, tooling and practices around things like uh, Terraform or, or Crossplane, and then getting into sort of day two operations around uh, monitoring. And, and John had mentioned, you know, some of the advantages of the Antho service mesh is observability. Uh, we can really help you um, take that to the next level, understand how to uh, use the tooling properly to uh, the most uh, efficacy within your organization, uh, as well as uh, we often uh, provide workshops on uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment. So the whole DevOps pipeline and uh, how to integrate that into your current uh, development environments. Then you can see some of the different uh, personas or, or um, audiences uh, we address uh, with the workshop. So from developers uh, all the way through to uh, decision makers, uh, whether they're managers or, or executives, uh, we can tailor the workshops uh, to uh, the audience that, that you want to bring. Uh, we do a number of public workshops uh, that uh, tend to be technical uh, in nature, but uh, we also do a lot of uh, tailored workshops for uh, individual organizations. So whether you're just starting on your cloud journey and your DevOps practice, or you're well along the way and, and just want to tune up um, or uh, investigate uh, some areas that um, maybe you're not as strong with or, or evaluate new technologies that may be coming down the pipe, uh, we can help you uh, with uh, all those areas. So from a uh, operational standpoint and, and a process, um, a, a lot of times we'll, we'll go through the steps that you see on, on the screen here. As I mentioned before, uh, we like to start with an assessment. So we get a baseline and a common understanding of uh, the capabilities, the tooling and the environments uh, you're working with. Uh, then we can uh, help with the build if there's a uh, new tooling policy or procedures uh, that need to be built out. Uh, we work collaboratively uh, with, with our customers uh, to do that. Uh, and then if you're early on uh, and uh, if you're early on in your journey or uh, just short staffed. Uh, a lot of times we, our managed services teams can take over uh, operations or assist in a joint operational model uh, of actually running your infrastructure, whether it's on-prem uh, or in the cloud. But a, a lot of times this is just a, an interim step to sort of the support and transfer model. So uh, a lot of times we'll, we'll take on operations as your teams are getting skilled up and then transfer operations back to you so that you can bring that uh, back in house or we can enter sort of a, a longer term uh, agreement where um, we, we take on uh, full operational responsibility uh, for those environments. And then uh, we also provide uh, augmented uh, support. So, Cloud Ops, uh, really, uh, we find ourselves unique uh, in the market in that um, we're agnostic but opinionated. We're not tied to a particular hyperscaler or set of vendors uh, on, on the software side. Um, we work across uh, all kinds of uh, different technologies uh, and, and different vendor stacks, uh, but we certainly have opinions as to um, what uh, what we feel is most efficient, and you know, if you're coming to us um, with with questions, we'll we'll help guide you based on the requirements of, of your organization. And so, not being uh, tightly coupled with particular vendors really gives us an advantage to help you make the right decisions for your organization without uh, sort of being um, being pushed in a particular direction based on existing commercial relationships from your uh, consulting uh, provider. 
we, we favor uh, open source and cloud native technologies. Uh, we see lots uh, of advantages there and, and certainly the market has um, uh, taken that opinion as well. Um, now, you know, the open source uh, ecosystem has certainly evolved over uh, the last decade or so, where uh, a lot of times the most popular open source and cloud native tools also have uh, a commercial support uh, edition or, or component. Uh, and so we can help you find the right balance between, say, fully open source community editions of tools and uh, those that have a, a commercial support element. Uh, and then, you know, we're constantly staying on top of uh, the uh, technology landscape, understanding what's in the ecosystem, how to take advantage uh, of these tools to maximum effect. And so we can really help you uh, choose the right tools, policies, and, and procedure to help you succeed uh, within your uh, IT environment. So we help uh, empower operations. Uh, we're, we're really about uh, a joint collaborative uh, model um, in, in the majority of cases. So you know we, we don't just want to take the keys and, and run everything sort of in a black box for you. Uh, we, we try to do it in, in a collaborative manner, help empower your operational teams. Uh, we've got the right expertise that we can deliver uh, at the right time to help you make the right decisions, solve technical problems. And then, you know, uh, one of our mottos, um, which is a, a bit of a pun and play on words, is, is get there faster. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're fans uh, of everything from infrastructure as code to GitOps and, and NoOps uh, types of environment. And by partnering with us, we can really help you accelerate uh, your journey and adoption of these technologies and techniques um, much faster than uh, would happen if you needed to sort of make all the mistakes along the way yourself and uh, figure out uh, how to get there. So uh, going back to uh, the, the uh, Cologic service, the interconnect and, and GCP, uh, we really wanted to look at and present uh, three typical use cases uh, that we see. Um, these are things that are enabled by having both your, your private uh, infrastructure connected to a cloud service, by something like the uh, Cologics in interconnect service that otherwise just wouldn't be feasible or, or would not operate uh, at a high level. So the three uh, use cases we'll look at quickly are uh, cloud bursting, um, leveraging uh, GCP for uh, data lake and, and data warehouse services, and then uh, disaster recovery and business continuity. So cloud bursting has uh, for a long time been the uh, holy grail of hybrid cloud uh, deployments. This idea that uh, from a, a cloud economics, a cloud economics standpoint, that I can own the base and then uh, rent the spikes of uh, my, my traffic and, and compute environments. So if you think of uh, anything from um, an, an e-commerce site that has uh, huge spikes, uh, say during the um, uh, Christmas uh, shopping season uh, to uh, enterprises that have uh, much larger compute requirements during a month end or, or a year end uh, type of event or during an acquisition um, or, or merger type of event. Uh, the idea is that you can own uh, the base workload requirements and, and have that as your private infrastructure. And then uh, instead of having to buy capacity servers and storage uh, and networking equipment for those peak periods that normally lies dormant when you're not in one of those peak periods, uh, you can use a GCP to really uh, scale up um, pretty much on demand as required uh, for those uh, events. 
And so, uh, you know, this uh, is a really a, a great capability uh, for uh, everything from uh, interactive uh, services like uh, uh, an e-commerce website or even um, uh, gaming platforms uh, to uh, batch jobs that often, um, uh, you know, you can speed up uh, something like a, a month end process by, by really just scaling up your uh, GCP footprint, using it for uh, the short amount of time that's required uh, to do the processing uh, and then spinning it back down. So you only pay for what you use during those peak periods. Um, and then you can uh, bring the data back into your uh, private environment. And GCP makes this really uh, attractive in a number of ways, uh, particularly for batch jobs. Uh, they have uh, compute types uh, such as preemptible uh, VMs, which are ultra low cost uh, VMs that can be spun up uh, within GCP, uh, work on your batch process and, and, and then spun back down uh, when they're uh, no longer needed. So uh, handling these type of traffic spikes and uh, additional compute uh, requirements are um, really a, a key feature of cloud bursting. The, the other sort of use case for cloud bursting is uh, for R&D or experimentation. If you uh, need a new uh, or, or you want to set up a, a new development environment quickly, um, you can do that really easily with the um, over the Cologix link. Um, within GCP, and it, it feels and acts like that environment is uh, within your own uh, private cloud uh, or, or your colo space, uh, but really you're able to spin it up without having to uh, procure new equipment, rack and stack, uh, do configurations. Um, you, you can get that stuff uh, quickly. And then the, the last use case within cloud bursting is really uh, from the R&D side, experimentation, um, where uh, you're able to uh, try out new services like Cloud Run, uh, serverless uh, components uh, that maybe your development teams want to experiment with. And uh, you want to, um, you can do that very easily uh, with the Cologix uh, interconnect services. And again, those, uh, those things will run and feel as if they're running on prem. Uh, the second uh, use case we wanted to look at was data lakes and, and BigQuery. Um, BigQuery in particular within GCP, setting up a data lake or data warehouse is very expensive and uh, time consuming. Um, GCP makes this uh, very easy. And so uh, with the Cologix link, it's easy to set up a data warehouse. It scales, um, it, it scales as required. It's a serverless environment. So you don't have to worry about managing any of the infrastructure. And then all of a sudden, you now have the capability to start doing uh, advanced analytics, a BI, and even start experimenting with uh, machine learning and AI models on your data. And so having data from your on-prem systems, whether it's CRM or ERP or IoT systems and, and streaming that into the uh, GCP environments like BigQuery uh, is really simple when you have this uh, high bandwidth, low latency uh, interconnect. And then the last use case I wanted to talk about is disaster recovery uh, and business continuity. Um, so setting up a, a full DR site uh, in uh, private cloud environments, again, is very expensive. You have to uh, purchase all the equipment, deploy it, uh, keep it up and running, and then uh, replicate the data. With, with GCP, what it allows you to do is uh, really just keep a pilot light on uh, over that Cologix link uh, to the Google environment. 
uh, to receive data as it's being replicated with a minimal footprint. And then when there is an event, uh, a disaster uh, event you need to respond to, you can rehydrate uh, that GCP environment to uh, sort of a, its full deployment uh, status very easily. And you're only paying for the resources you use while you're using it. Uh, and so these are really the uh, three um, uh, great use cases that are enabled by the Cologix, Interconnect, and GCP that normally um, you wouldn't be able to do without uh, that high speed, low latency connection. And with that, I will uh, open it up to uh, Q&A. Okay, thank you for that, Danielle. And, uh, and uh, CloudOps and the GCI teams were, uh, I know we're button up against time here. So we did have a couple of questions that uh, uh, have come up here. And if there's anybody else that has questions, please feel free again to put them in the chat. We'll try to answer them quickly and um, uh, let everybody move on with their day as well. But uh, uh, a couple of the questions that came in, um, why would I use a network exchange provider or hosted connection when I could cross connect directly to Google? And I believe that's probably- uh, more Yeah, question. I'll take that one. <clears throat> Happy to step in. Yeah, so for those customers who can get right next to Google um, in a given market, so again, in say the Montreal 3 Data Center, uh, the cross-connect option is great. And especially if you need that higher bandwidth. So typically we recommend that to customers who are looking for that 110 or, or in certain markets, that 100 gig option, um, or are potentially looking to lag. Um, so if you wanna go uh, two by 10 or four by 10, looking at those types of higher bandwidth options, if you really have those needs in cloud, that's a great way to get that again on the private side, reduce some of your cost for it, get that privacy. Um, but it is a cross connect. So you need to go through that standard process of, of receiving, managing LOAs, that connectivity, there's that bigger physical component to it. If you go with a network exchange, it can be easier because a lot of that work has already been done for you. So if you're looking to lessen the amount of work and management your team needs, uh, as well as provide a more flexible solution where uh, you can spin it up and down on demand as needed, for those circuits or buy it a bandwidth and then increase that bandwidth over time in smaller increments, you have a little bit more flexibility to do that with a network exchange. Um, so if you're really trying to liken it to something, I, I would probably say that that dedicated cross-connect interconnect is probably a lot more like buying a home. Um, you have to have more capital up front, a little more, bit more time to spend, a little bit more maintenance, but you can get more out of it versus a network exchange being more like leasing on a month-to-month -month lease where you can get the size you need and the location you need with what you need, and then you can walk away from it when you're done. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, another question that came up is, uh, can, we tip, can we use a typical load balancer with Anthos instead of the defaults? Uh, I'll leave that with the Cloud Ops and GCI team. John, do you want to take that or I can take that? I'm happy to take it. Um, yeah, so uh, currently if it's on-prem, uh, with VMware, we have a bundled option where we use Seesaw. It's uh, set up very quickly and easily for you. Uh, on bare metal, we use Metal LB. Um, and support for Metal LB on VMware is coming soon as well. Um, if you want to bring your own load balancer, we do have some very tight integrations with F5. So that means the, the install and the configuration process is pretty seamless. Um, but you can bring any load balancer. So if you're using Citrix or something else, you can still do that. Um, if the integration is not there, that just means that the install process uh, might just be a little more work, um, but there's no issue with running Citrix or another uh, load balancer with, with Anthos. Fantastic. All right. Um, maybe I'll leave this with CloudOps. Everybody gets a, a turn, right? So what type of Anthos ready storages can be leveraged? Uh, so uh, there, there are a number uh, of different storage uh, solutions that can be uh, leveraged with uh, Anthos. Um, uh, probably the one uh, we see the most is, is Portworks um, from uh, Pure Storage. Uh, but uh, you know, again, 
There are uh, solutions from uh, Dell uh, and, and other vendors that are available. So uh, again, Anthos has uh, a lot of flexibility and the partner ecosystem uh, is growing um, uh, by leaps and bounds on, on a regular basis. And um, as John and, and Nick had mentioned before, you know, there are new features uh, coming uh, all the time, including support for uh, VMs uh, that we'll be seeing soon. So uh, there, there are a lot of options depending on um, where you may already have uh, storage uh, investments. Um, something can uh, probably be done. Uh, but uh, again, if you're looking for something uh, new, um, uh, uh, pure, pure storage um, is uh, definitely worth a look. All right, thank you for that. I'll give a quick moment here for anybody else that wants to pose a question in the chat field. And with that, I thank everybody for joining us today uh, on this GCI Roadshow. And thank you again to our panelists from CloudOps and Google Cloud. Uh, and, you know, we look forward to growing our partnerships and uh, helping our customers in their cloud journeys. Everybody have a wonderful day.